Ethylene oxide alternatives, gamma sterilization alternatives. What about low temperature sterilization methods? What about low temperature vaporized hydrogen peroxide for which a consensus standard was recently recognized by FDA? What about new methods like supercritical CO2? I was able to catch up with Tony Eisenhut, who is the CEO and co-founder of Novo Sterilis. They're working on a novel sterilization technology and Tony was able to unpack for me this new FDA news, as well as a deep dive into education about sterilization. I hope you enjoy it. What kinds of things even get sterilized? It, you'd be surprised, but um, everything from Band-Aids to endoscopes that they use uh, in, in hospitals and healthcare situations, um, up to therapeutics, uh, you know, drugs that we, we take are, are often sterilized. Uh, some of the regenerative medicine products that are being introduced into the market today are sterilized as well. So how, how does this happen? I know we did a segment one time on the show and I actually, I actually went to the lab and I took a syringe and I, and I, and I autoclaved it as it were, mm -hmm. and I brought it out and showed that, okay, not all devices can be sterilized just using heat because it was a pile of, of goop at that point. <laughs> What are some different ways that people sterilize things, maybe historically, and then some of the more novel ways that are coming out? Yeah, it's, I mean, sterilization has been around for centuries, fire, right? You had a wounds, I don't know, going back to the, the dark ages, and you'd use some fire, a piece of metal, and you'd cauterize a wound. Well, you were also sterilizing that, that particular wound. Um, clearly not a, a technique that's uh, broadly applicable to uh, medical devices today, uh, but there's, you know, some of the workhorses of the terminal sterilization, especially on the industrial side for, for medical device manufacturers, pharmaceutical companies, regenerative medicine, have historically been uh, ethylene oxide sterilization, often referred to as ETO, and gamma radiation. They probably make up about 95% of the total uh, terminal sterilization market for uh, industrial applications. And this is something we didn't really talk about before, but but I know something we've experienced in our development processes, and I think you could speak to a bit, not all sterilization methods work on all products, partly because of the materials of the product. I remember working with Gamma and, oh, well, you can't use that plastic because it's going to yeah. embrittle it and it's going to yellow it. Yeah, no, it, and so... You know, the, the workhorses, as I just said, were the, the Gamma and the ETO, but um, more recently, and, and I say more recently, you know, over the last 20 plus years, there have been novel sterilization modalities or alternative sterilization modalities that are, are coming forward, whether it's vaporized hydrogen peroxide or um, our modality, for example, supercritical carbon dioxide, um, hydrogen peroxide plasma sterilization, ozone sterilization. There have been a number of uh, new technologies that have been developed over the time because exactly what you said, medical devices, therapeutics are getting uh, more complex and more materials are being used. Uh, sometimes combinations of, if you look at a drug eluding stent, right? You've got a therapeutic, you got a polymer, and you've got a metal component all in one device, and that device has to be sterilized. And so, as you said, maybe gamma is not compatible with the polymer, EO might not be compatible with the, the therapeutic. And, and so alternative sterilization modalities are, are necessary today as the med device world evolves and moves forward. And it seems to be picking up speed. Um, talk to us about this. I mean, it, I've, I've noticed in industry, right? Like in academia, people love to innovate and you've always got something new because we've got to write a new paper and we've got to get P less than 0.05, right? So <laughs> any, anything new we can possibly show, <laughs> like we want to do it. But in industry, it's very much the opposite. Once we find something that works, do not touch it, do not let it move. But we're seeing this increased uptick in novel sterilization methods, Novo Sterilis, which we'll talk about as an example yeah. of that, why the why the right now huge uptick in it? What's going on with these established yeah. processes? Yeah, the the interest is has grown dramatically, and and you know, <laughs> as much as we love uh, the sterilization industry, it's you know it's not the most glamorous. You know, it's it's a necessary evil in a, a lot of manufacturers' mind, and it's important. And I'm not saying that they don't. Uh, value it but if you're a manufacturing company you're trying to grow revenue 
and sterilization processes don't grow revenue per, mm. per se in and of themselves. So um, if it works, people have historically stuck with it. But what's driving the change today is innovation in the products that are, are being brought to market. Uh, but there's also some regulatory uh, and, and really uh, clean tech concerns um, and, and, and safety concerns. For example, ethylene oxide, it, it's very effective, um, but it is a carcinogenic, mutagenic, toxic gas. Um, and as EPA is looking at ethylene oxide and changing some of the regulations relative to emissions, um, the cost of ethylene oxide is just getting more and more expensive for them to be able to meet those standards. And with that being the case, you know, companies are starting to look for alternatives. There was an incident in 19 where a couple of facilities got shuttered, one on a temporary basis, one on a permanent basis. And so the availability of ethylene oxide capacity was greatly reduced. Lead times got very long. And, and again, candidly, if you're a small company, um, you weren't really even getting a chance to get in the queue because the larger companies um, were were taking up most of the capacity. The other issue is, is the capacity is dropping. The small ones have no chance of getting in at that point. It's just yeah, it gets a very expensive, door. and and it, it it just gets tougher to get in. Um, and the lead times and the wait times get a lot longer than than what they had been previously. Um, and so you know, and then on the other front, in in 2019, it was kind of a double whammy for the sterilization industry. Um, when it comes to gamma, cobalt-60, um, which is uh, required for gamma radiation, um, supply channels were tight. You know, cobalt comes from some of the more uh, challenging uh, so or, uh, political, geopolitical regions of the world. And as a result, um, the supply chain was a little bit tight and there created concerns for people. Pricing went up and what was the availability going to be? Um, you know, and, and, you know, in fairness, some of that has alleviated, but it's on people's mind. It's still a, a fresh wound per se. And so they don't want to be in a situation with their sterilization supply chain where they can't put product into the market because if you can't terminally sterilize a product that's required to be terminally sterilized, you can't sell it. Yeah, you're sort of you're dead on arrival there. You you got my product sitting there, but if it's not ready to go, it's not ready to go. Absolutely. Well, FDA FDA has ways of categorizing these sterilization methods, and I think these are these are fascinating. Unpack this for us uh, as as a as a technology is maturing. What are the categories that FDA has established yes. for these sterilization technologies? So really, there's two designations. There's the established uh, sterilization modality and then novel. And then within the established sterilization designation, there is category A um, and category B. And so category A are the, uh, the industry workhorses, the ones that have been around heat, EO, gamma. There is a long history. Um, and, and so they are well understood at the agency. Category B are newer modalities um, that have gone through um, more evaluation by, by the agency and have generally met some standard. And, and of late, um, it's been uh, industry standards, whether it's ISO or, or other standards that that ex exists out there. And so, for example, vaporized hydrogen peroxide, uh, flexible chamber, uh, ETO, ozone had moved from what was novel into uh, established category B. And then there's another category, which is, is the novel. And those are the newer modalities um, that the agency is getting their hand around. It doesn't mean, um, and one of the misconceptions we see often is that when people hear novel, they think, oh, it's not going to get it, be able to get approved, or it's never been approved, or it's going to take a long time to get approved. Um, and the reality is that's that's not necessarily the case. It's it's that the agency is looking for uh, the same information that the other modalities have, but it's being generated on a on a per submission basis. And so, um, you know, in our instance, and we're designated as a novel sterilization modality today. Um, you know, there were four clearances last year by 
uh, device manufacturers who um, are using our modality and, and were able to get their device approved by the, the FDA last year. So the novel and established categories are not, like you said, a, a way of FDA saying, oh, that's never going to happen. It's actually a way of FDA acknowledging that there's a maturation process of these, and they're looking at it on a per submission basis for the novel ones and then looking at it more established for the established ones. Yeah, yeah that's a, a good way to, to describe <laughs> I wonder it. wonder why and, they picked those words. Right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and they, and it's, well, one, it's changing. Oh, good. Well, I just, it, it's changing from the... Um, agency's perspective because you know they understand the supply chain risk that exists out there today and so in 2019 they um, put together a program uh, called the innovation challenge grant program and it was or is the fda's way of helping novel sterilization modalities or new techniques to move into the mainstream to help the FDA understand them better so people can switch from the, I'll say category A, established techniques into some of the newer modalities as required by device complexity and supply chain issues. And I, and I understand we'll talk about this in a minute also as well is that uh, Novo Sterilis was a recipient of that of that challenge grant award. So congratulations, we'll, we'll dig into that in just a few minutes. Um, is, this is a pre-novel uh, step. Is, these would be devices that are going to become novel, or these devices that are in the novel category. Uh, are you speaking about the sterilization oh. technique or the devices themselves? Oh, I was thinking the challenge grant stuff. Was that that's all for like novel and pre-novel devices? Uh, it, it is for uh, it's for novel devices as well as established. So, for example, Noxalizer, um, NO2, nitrogen dioxide sterilization, um, is one of the recipients. Um, and I, I believe they are uh, still designated as novel, but not 100% sure on, on that. Um, we are at supercritical CO2, but uh, Steris was part of the program with vaporized hydrogen peroxide. That's in this category B established technique. Um, they have a, Steris got a second one with radiation, um, and that is a category B uh, established technique. And then um, Striker through their TSO3 platform, which is also an established category B technique, is a vaporized hydrogen peroxide ozone. Uh, approach to terminal sterilization. So FDA's effort there was independent of which category it fell into. We're going we're to come back to the category stuff because yeah. I really want to spend some time with you on Novo Sterilis technology and, mm -hmm. and that award uh, that you got as well. But I want to back all the way up for just a moment because okay. we're, t we're sitting here talking about sterilization and I think it, it, it will come as a shock to many people that while, as you said a moment ago, terminal sterilization is recommended or, or required by FDA where possible, yes. that, that's, this isn't always the case. Like not everything that we think, you know, in our minds should be sterilized actually is. Tell us more about this. Yeah. So the FDA's guidance is, is that if something can be terminally sterilized, they want it to be terminally sterilized. Now, if terminal sterilization will impact, negatively impact the efficacy of the product or the effectiveness, then that's not a good path forward. And so in those instances, the FDA is saying aseptic manufacturing is the appropriate approach. And so, you know, and this is a, a moving bogey to, to, to some regard, right? Because if you go back a decade, for example, tissue products were not being terminally sterilized. They were being aseptically manufactured. So if you go in for a surgery and you have an ACL replacement that's needed and you're using an allograft, um, that was most likely aseptically manufactured. But with new techniques um, that are, are out there today, um, there are terminal sterilization solutions for products like that. But also think of large molecule therapeutics, uh, a number of mm. those because proteins um, are often not compatible with uh, radiation or ethylene oxide um, are not terminally sterilized. They're aseptically manufactured. When you think of these things, I'm putting it in my body, it must be sterilized. And the answer is <laughs> not, not quite. It might be aseptically manufactured. That's, that's absolutely fascinating. 
Let's talk a little bit of people who are get close to the sterilization industry industry, excuse me, yeah. keep hearing this ten to the minus six, six number. Yeah. And it always is this magic number. Yeah. And we've talked so, about it on the show before, but unpack this for us uh, from your perspective. Yeah, from from our per so s sterility assurance level of ten to the minus six is representing that not only are you killing the microbial population of six logs, which is the overkill method, that you are doubling that condition. So theoretically, you're killing 12 logs of microorganisms. You can't grow 12 logs of microorganisms, so you really can't prove it. But from a mathematical perspective, by doubling the conditions, whether it's time or the concentration of additive, you are giving a much higher level, 99 point, I think it's 999 level of confidence that uh, there's a, a one in a million chance of an infection or of a, microbial, a microbe and surviving the process. And I think you, you brought it to light very clearly in my mind that that you can do log reductions on something, but that's just reductions from where you started. Mm -hmm. Tell us about like how starting load matters and why the number of reductions that you might have to do might vary depending on that starting load. Yeah, so there's there's different approaches to achieving sterility assurance level of 10 to the minus six. So there's the bio burden or overkill method as it's referred to sometimes. And so that's where you just assume a worst case scenario that you're going to have a six log level of contamination and so you get your bi strips from from your supplier and and you test and you prove that the challenge organism whichever is the hardest to kill for your sterilization technique you can kill six logs of that microbe and and so in that scenario you double the condition to get the sterility assurance level of 10 to the minus six in some instances, and, and one of the um, approaches that the, the agency um, is, is very open to is a bioburden uh, method. So in that scenario, you actually <sighs> categorize your bioburden. And so you look at what are the microbes that are part of your manufacturing process. You look at the levels, and so you test for them. And then what you show is that you're able to kill not only that particular organism, but that particular organism or those organisms at the level of your bio burden. So, for example, if you are in a manufacturing environment and you have a native bio burden of one log, so 10, 10 microbes, um, the agency is going to say, we're, we're not going to do as low as one or two logs. So there's kind of a minimum threshold of, of three logs of, of bio burden. So in that scenario, you'd say, okay, we have three logs that we have to reduce. And now to get to sell 10 to the minus six, we have to add six more logs. So actually in that scenario, you're showing a nine log reduction versus the overkill method where you're showing a 12 log reduction. And where that comes into play is that all of a sudden you can start reducing maybe the amount of additive that you need to use in your sterilization process. Maybe you reduce the amount of time. So for these more sensitive devices, you're able to use a less harsh condition that allows you to achieve terminal sterilization without um, negatively impacting the performance of your device. That's really cool. So you don't just take this blind approach to it. You actually go in and say, what do we actually have here? And then how do we yeah. get to the level? And we're not making it any less sterile than we would have otherwise. We're just actually knowing where we started and knowing where we ended up. Yeah. And there's a cost associated with that monitoring because as you are in your manufacturing process, you have to confirm with some level of frequency that your native bio burden and the amount of bio burden hasn't changed. And so if you use this technique, um, it's really a, a cost benefit analysis of how much does that ongoing monitor cost us relative to the value of 
terminally sterilizing as opposed to aseptically manufacturing. Because even though aseptically manufacturing isn't as safe as terminal sterilization, it's significantly more expensive. And I've seen that you know, aseptic manufacturing may cost up to 10% of your, your, your cost of goods sold, whereas terminal sterilization is in that 1% to 2% range. So for products that are being aseptically manufactured, uh, that may not actually be the sweet spot. They might really want a sterilization method that works with their product so that they can then actually reduce costs. Absolutely. Wow, that's, that's fascinating. Well, speaking of methods, so at the end of July, uh, FDA uh, announced they recognized a new standard. And of course, as we've talked about on the show mm -hmm. before, FDA maintains a consensus standards database, a consensus standards database. Um, where they're not saying you have to do these things, but they're basically saying, if you follow this standard, which we recognize, then we're not going to ask you those questions. We're sort of trusting that that's a reasonable way to go about things. And not every standard's included in there. And this goes, I mean, this goes from everything from electrical safety standards to risk management to how you run quality systems and everything else. But they recognized at the end of July, ISO 22441, ISO 22441, which is a uh, low temperature vaporized hydrogen peroxide method. Tony, tell us just a little bit more about, about this method and then about this approach of recognized consensus standards for sterilization methods versus there's another way to do it. And I think you're yeah. gonna, you'll, you'll unpack those two for us. Yeah, so the consensus standards are, you know, really they are, are programs and efforts that happen over years. And so, you know, for vaporized hydrogen peroxide, they've been pursuing that. And, and by meeting those standards and being able to set some of those standards, um, they're able to then go to the agency and say, you know, here are the standards, we've met them. Can you move us from novel modality to established, and in this case, category B for vaporized hydrogen peroxide? Um, and, and so that is, is one approach and it's been, it has been the approach, right? Up, up until 2022. So in, in May of 2022, the FDA started a, a new program as part of their efforts to support new sterilization techniques, um, a, a master file program. And in 2022, it was a, a 510K master file program where if you were sterilizing your 510K clear device with ethylene oxide, you could actually use a sterilization company's master file program as a reference to move from EO to the new modality of your choice without going through a full FDA program uh, or full FDA submission and a resubmission of your 510K. Because oftentimes changing your sterilization method is going to kick you right back to, hey, submit a new 510K. Yeah, absolutely. And so in addition to that program, so that was 22, in April of 23, so th this year, the agency took it one step further. And so it's not just 510Ks. There's a, um, and I wrote it down, but it, it's the uh, CDRH's master file pilot program uh, for radiation. So it's the radiation pilot program. And that's, you know, a little bit of a misnomer because it's moving from radiation or ethylene oxide. So it's not just radiation, mm -hmm. but whereas the previous, the 22 program was for uh, 510k clear devices this is for class 3 pma uh, designated devices and so now you can move from a radiation or an eo modality to a uh, alternative sterilization modality if that modality has a, a master file that's in place and so what the agency has shared with us is that um, a way to move from a novel designation to an established uh, designation would be to go through that master file program as an alternative to a consensus standard approach. You're sort of giving a recipe for, hey, here, here's how this is going to be done. And then when some company references that, they look and go, oh, yeah, we, we do have that in our file. And off you go. Absolutely. Yeah. That's really cool. I understand yeah. you guys might have a little bit of experience with this particular methodology. Tony, I would love it if you would just unpack um, your technology at, at Nova Sterilis. 
Um, also, how you're approaching, you know, getting through these hurdles, and also, as we, as we mentioned earlier, this FDA uh, challenge grant that you are one of a very few uh, recipients of, yeah. along with some some big sterilization names. And so, again, congratulations. Tell us about um, wh whatever order you want, your technology, your process, and about these interactions with the FDA. Yeah. So. Um, I'll, I'll start with the, the challenge grant program because it's it, it's really a fantastic program and it's something that's moved our our technology uh, and our platform forward um, at an accelerated rate. So as I said earlier, the the agency um, recognized there were some challenges with ethylene oxide sterilization. Um, they put a challenge grant out there um, where they had a, a request to the, the marketplace for companies to propose their sterilization methodologies or new techniques um, and and to enter into the challenge program the challenge grant program and you know uh, i shared with you as we we talked a little bit before gene is that originally it was a program we weren't going to uh, partake in because there was no money associated with it. And so I'm looking at this grant saying, why are we gonna do a grant and there's no money? But I will tell you three years later, we were fortunate enough to be one of four companies selected as as, as part of this program. Um, you know, Steris, Noxalizer, who's a partner with, it has a partnership with Sterigenics and, and Stryker and, and ourself, um, is that with what I know now, you know, if they had offered 500,000 instead of what we got, I would have turned the the money down and taken what we got because the interaction wow. with the agency has been fantastic. It's been collaborative, it's been informative, it's really helped us move this modality. And as I said, you know, last year there were four clearances using supercritical CO2 uh processing as as part of their uh submission. Um, and a large part of that was, you know, the help from the agency to um, answer questions and, and be open to um, some submissions and information that we we're able to pr provide. And, and so it was through that program that we were able to educate the, you know, some of the key people at the, at the agency on what our technology is about. And so, you know, supercritical carbon dioxide you know, we we joke, you know, we're an overnight success. It's only taken 20 years um, of 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 developing the technology and and moving it forward. Um, we were actually uh, building upon a knowledge base that existed before. So supercritical CO2 processing's been around for 50 plus years. It's one of the way they decaffeinate coffee. It's the way they extract uh, taxol from yew trees. Um, it, which is, you know, used as an oncology drug. And so there's a large body of knowledge around supercritical CO2 processing and, and the safety of supercritical CO, CO2. We applied it to the medical uh, arena and, and specifically sterilization um, starting in about 2000. We were commercial in 2008 uh, where we brought the first uh, terminal sterilization process to the, the tissue banking industry, um, where we were able to not negatively impact the performance of uh, tissue, whether it be bone or soft tissue like ACLs, you know, ligaments, uh, uh, dermis, et, et cetera. Um, but what is our modality? What's unique about our, our approach? So we are a low temperature uh, terminal sterilization process. Um, we are minimally reactive in the uh, with the products that we're we're sterilizing, and our probably most unique calling card is we're deep penetrating because of the pressures at which we operate our our process. We're able to penetrate something as as dense as a femoral head, which is about as dense a material as you can have. Supercritical CO two will penetrate to the center of that and we're able to achieve uh, durability assurance levels of 10 to the minus six on a, on a product like that. And the uniformity of the uh, exposure is um, fantastic. And so we're, we're able to sterilize complex devices that have multiple materials um, with that they're manufactured out, for example, an endoscope 
25 to 30 different materials. Um, and, and we've shown the, the ability to be compatible with that variety of materials and still achieve terminal sterilization. That's kind of incredible, especially on the complex surfaces, because um, honestly, how, how things are packaged even has always had an effect on sterilization methods. And I mean, how does that compare? Like you mentioned a femoral head. How does that compare to ETO? And, and per perhaps also in the question of time, even if they could both do it, how do they compare with respect to time? Yeah, so, you know, ETOs are the workhorse, right? And I, I, I don't want to, you know, <laughs> throw too many darts. You know, obviously there is the uh, environmental and health and, and safety risk, but ethylene oxide, um, you know, has, has proven to be a, a real workhorse. Where where we come in is if if you have something, again, with that complex shape that you want to sterilize, um, we are not only the the deepest penetrating um, but we penetrate at the the fastest rate of any of the different sterilization modalities when you look at the the complexity of the de device um, and one of the things with supercritical co2 is you don't have a post outgassing so the ethylene oxide you may have a you know one hour to two hour processing cycle and a 15 to 20 hour outgassing cycle in our uh, modality, you run that one hour, two hour, four hour cycle. And then when you're done and you depressurize the chamber, you're done. You're ready to ship. There isn't mm. an outgassing component that, that's associated with it. One of the other, I think, uh, when you start looking at as a manufacturer, how do you want to sterilize? And, and so there are a number of manufacturers who want to use contract sterilization facilities. And so something like an ethylene oxide or a gamma where there's a large CapEx associated with it and a lot of expertise to make sure that you're complying with OSHA standards and EPA standards, um, you know, outsourcing that manufacturing makes a lot of sense. In, in our case, you have the ability to either outsource or bring that manufacturing or sterilization capability actually in-house and actually make it part of your inline uh, processing. Um, we are geared more towards the, the mid-range volume. So the really high volume applications, for example, we talked about Band-Aids in the beginning. It's not a good fit for supercritical CO2 sterilization because the chamber size, I mean, in ethylene oxide, there's chambers that you can drive a tractor trailer into and sterilize in its entirety. From a supercritical CO2 standpoint, um, there are no chambers um, of, of that size or of that uh, volume capacity. Wow, well, that sounds like an absolutely fascinating technology. Do you have any? You, you want to share any um, any um, uh, cool stories or things that you guys have been uh, proud of that you've achieved? Yeah, so we've we have over the years sterilized. Uh, it's it's a broad array, everything from, you know donor tissue from from uh, cadaver tissue used in in surgeries um, animal tissues uh, xenografts to therapeutics to spices so it turns out vanilla beans and black peppercorns um, oftentimes are sterilized with eo and residual eo because of the way their uh, shapes are have dead pockets in there. And so people, uh, we've had a couple of spice companies that have, have come and said, we're looking for an alternative to, to ethylene oxide sterilization for our spices. Um, bunny suits. Wow. I mean, I, it's, that's actually shocking to me that ETO is used for spices. I'm, I'm a little shocked yeah, actually, but yeah. wow. Uh, I was too, when we got the phone call, I, I did not know that. Um, and so, you know, there've been uh, a number of, of, of devices that, that we've actually sterilized. One of the the other things, and a bit of a side note to this conversation, but supercritical CO2 is not only used for sterilization, but we actually use it with some of the tissue products that I've talked about. Um, we're actually using it to decellularize. And so when you get, uh, you know, these tissues are coming in, you need to decellularize them. Oftentimes, um, some pretty mm. harsh chemicals were being used, and supercritical CO2 is a great solvent for cleaning. And so we've been decellularizing tissue and there were some really neat projects at universities. Um, University of Arizona did a project where they decellularized spinach leaves and then sterilized it with our process, did both processes with our process, and then used the 
uh, fiber backbone of the spinach leaves as a template for uh, creating vascular mats, seeding those uh, see the stems of the spinach leaf with uh, stem cells and creating vascular mats to make a model of uh, for vascular drug delivery to anaerobic tumors. So some really wow. cool stuff that we've seen all over across time. the board. Creative minds out there using the technology in ways we actually never envisioned when we started. Well, that's so cool when you get a platform and it works for so many things and has you know similarities to, but then differences from established ways. You can you can really play with some cool stuff. Who who should be coming to you, Tony? Who, who you know if they're listening to this video and they're like, wow, this is really educational. I'm I'm thankful for all this. What sorts of people should be picking up a phone and giving you a call or emailing you or connecting, however you tell us to? Yeah, so it, whether it's email or call, we're still old school. We we answer the phone, so uh, we'll we'll uh, we love talking to people about what what their needs are. And so at the end of the day, if someone has a a product that they're developing and they want to understand what their sterilization options are, we have a proof of concept program that we run that's kind of down and dirty, simple that people can send us their product or their materials that they're going to use in a product just to see if they're compatible. And whether it's our modality or anyone else's, I've been, I've been in the, the you know medical device world for a long time now. And what I will tell you is you bring new products to market or you start designing them, which you know, Gene, a lot of people don't think about sterilization to the end. And you assume that something's going to work and oftentimes we see that people have to go and redesign materials being used or redesign configurations because sterilization became a roadblock. And so I would really challenge people that are in the earliest stages to, to do some compatibility testing of your material with whatever modality. And we have people, you know, they're going to do ETO and gamma and us and vaporized hydrogen peroxide. And, and I look at those as the people who are doing it the right way understand what the compatibility is so when you build it you know which direction you're going to go later down the, the line um, someone who's got a device that um, they're concerned about the eto supply chain and, and they want to come come to us and just uh, talk about what uh, an insurance policy looks like for proving out that this this approach works should something happen with their you know current current approach um, and then oftentimes people who are doing biologically uh, oriented or biologics, because there's not a lot of terminal sterilization modalities that are compatible with, with biologics. And although we're not compatible with all biologics, um, we've got a, a pretty broad uh, effort that we've undertaken to show our compatibility with, with a number of biologics, whether they're therapeutics or, or uh, scaffolds used for delivering uh, drugs. That's kind of amazing, too, because you think about it, the point of sterilization is to remove biologics. So when you find a sterilization method that's balanced enough that it can retain what you're trying to retain and kill what you're trying to kill, I think that's a, that's a pretty fun niche to be in. Yeah, you know, it's 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 been great. And, and obviously, we're we're learning a lot. And we've been doing this for 20 plus years at this point, And and we're still learning um, as to what else we can do with the the platform to not only sterilize and clean and decellularize, but um, the new frontier is going to be functionalized. And so there is uh, some approach using different additives where you can functionalize materials uh, for specific applications. Very, very cool. Tony Eisenhut, CEO and co-founder of Novo Sterilis. I'm thankful to our mutual friend Kelly Sycon for putting yeah. us in touch. And Tony, I'm so thankful for you spending the time with us today um, to talk about this. Very, very educational. I think people are really going to enjoy this. I appreciate it, Gina. Great. Thanks for taking the time to you and, and Steve to, to spend some time with, with me this morning. It's fantastic. We appreciate it. And for everyone listening, as always, we want MedTech Crossroads to be education that saves you time on your MedTech development journey. And I think uh, Tony just did that today. So thanks again, Tony. Absolutely. Have a great day.